So I'm a wildlife biologist. Um, I've trained as a scientist for the last 14 years. Um, spent some time in the US studying, and um, but I've done research in India for the last 14 years in several states looking at issues between people and wildlife. Right. So I've looked at conflict between people and wildlife, looked at impacts of wildlife tourism, looked at how um, land use change is occurring and how that affects uh, uh, species move movement. Yeah. Um, but how I got into it originally was, um, I have a father who's a very well-known tiger biologist. So from the age of one, I got taken to a lot of parks, saw my first wild tiger and wild leopard by the time I was two years old. Oh, and did that for about 16 years of my life mm -hmm. and I didn't really want to be a biologist because I'd seen him and I'd seen how extraordinary he was right. and I'd also seen the very tough side to being a conservationist and so for a while I resisted doing the same thing right. but eventually when it came to do my own field work and I ended up doing a master's in science at Yale and while doing research came back to India and from then on I haven't stopped doing this. So. Right. And so what have been some of the findings that you that you found that haven't, or that have been different from what's been the traditional outlook for? So, a um, couple of things. I think, um, so for my PhD study, I looked at um, distributions of animals across India over 100, 150 years ago, rebuilding British historic records where they had seen and shot animals, and right. looking at 100, 150 years later where these animals were still around. Mm -hmm. And what I found was there was massive, widespread contractions of species. Okay. And um, that for animals like tigers and wild dogs, they were basically now found in parks. And ev any, any location outside, they were gone. But then I found um, animals like leopards being very adaptable and still being found outside. Yeah. And so the story of India's wildlife is very species specific. Mm -hmm. Um, but the two things that I stood out that are working is one, our park system definitely works. 4% of India is protected yeah. with the, about 1% really being effective. But even the 4% is holding species and needs to be continually managed effectively. Right. Um, then for certain species like black buck and chinkara, I found that the places that they were still around are largely Western India, Gujarat, Rajasthan. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's this inherent cultural tolerance for wildlife that we see in this country okay. and that's what continually surprises me because now I work on conflict and I've been to maybe uh, my research teams and I we've been to about six seven thousand villages in India in Rajasthan MP Maharashtra and the four South Indian states okay. and what we're finding is that there's a lot of losses people su uh, suffer particularly crop damage far less death to people or um, injury um, but when they do lose crops in, in places where they only have grow one crop a year, it yeah. can be devastating for your family, right? But you, what blows my mind is that people are so inherently tolerant for these losses. And I've, I mean, I've sat in villages surveying people saying, why don't you retaliate? They retaliate sometimes when livestock is killed or human injury and death take place. But for crop loss, they almost never retaliate. And I've had, you know, People in, in, I had this woman in Bandipur sit next to me and she basically said, you know, it's their home as much as it's ours. And I'm, a pig coming and raiding my crop field periodically is not, I don't consider that as serious damage. Whereas a herd of elephants coming through and wiping the whole thing out, I would be more concerned about that. So there's clearly people in India, at least rural people, have adapted to living with wildlife. It's not an us versus them. It's, I think it depends on how, um, how they, they feel. I mean, how significant the loss is, right. yeah. Um, what really disturbed me about the conflict studies that I've done is that uh, we're entitled to compensation, so anybody can file paperwork with the government and get, uh, uh, get their mo at least a money uh, reimbursed for their losses. What, we have, what we're finding is 60, 70 percent of people we've surveyed, regardless of which, which state, don't even file for compensation. So where's the question of getting anything back? And then of those who file, it takes six months to a year or much later. And many people just give up because they're frustrated. And I, fe I feel like this is a system that needs to be fixed very quickly because this is not a small number. Just in, in Karnataka alone, over the last 10 years, I'm looking at forest department data and you have about almost a lakh and 20,000 incidents of conflict reported. And so we're losing information on unreported stuff. So there's a lot of people not reporting. And of those reported, we really need to make sure the system's working for them and, right. and compensates them. Because those of us living in Mumbai or Bangalore have the luxury of saying we want tigers and elephants, right. but we don't live right next to them. So if you want local people to really 
ensure that this tolerance stays, we really need to get, get in there and try and at least improve the system. Uh, is tourism in any way linked to keeping or increasing the population? Do you think like these people or these places that are bringing in the money are using that in a way to help? I've yeah. seen very little of it. I think a lot of it, um, I've seen some of, I mean, the personal profits that individuals and corporations right. make are ra rarely sent back to the, they're not sent back to the park. Mm -hmm. So the park makes revenue from the gate receipts and the right. camera fees, but the actual money that the tourist uh, lodge owners are making are not going back to the park, nor are they really going back to the local communities. Yeah. So clearly there's a disconnect here. And um, I, I feel like a lot more can be done because there are very sustainable tourism models that you hear of in other countries right. in Africa or in South America. But I've seen very little of that in India right now. And you also mentioned there seems to be a big difference in the, in the prices between the North and the South. Is that because the North has the bigger tigers, lions? Or... No, I think it's, um, I, it was actually because I did the study in 10 parks in India. So I've, I found that the Southern parks are very highly regulated. Um, and it, it was actually a pleasant surprise because I think in, in, in Central India and in North India it's very easy to see a tiger so there's a huge demand that's there. Whereas to see a tiger in, in, in Nagarhole or Bandipur you have to work a lot harder and have to be a lot luckier. So in some sense there's a filter right there because people who are, a lot of people coming from the outside who come to India for a week or, or, and they say check. I want to see my tiger, they're going to go to places where it's easier to see a tiger, right? But I, I, I think the system itself, um, I think in terms of setting up how many routes there are, how many um, to, uh, vehicles are allowed inside, how many people are allowed inside, all those limits have to be established and they have to be capped and not keep uh, keep on increasing this as demand grows as well. I mean, make it a lottery system where first come, first serve. Mm -hmm. The first the 100, 200 people who want to show up that day, they get to go into the park. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, okay. you know, and that's not there. It's still, you know. <laughs> Do you think it'll ever be there? I think, I think it's there. I mean, it's there at a small scale in some parks. I think, the, I mean, the Supreme Court uh, case kind of woke everybody up mm -hmm. and said we need to regulate, regulate, regulate. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anybody's actually gone back a year and a half later to see how much regulations actually come in. Yeah. Yeah. And like, last question, you said you got the, the toll free number coming up, but what else are you working on? Um, so um, one of the biggest projects, actually the biggest project I have going right now is looking at biodiversity outside parks because uh, uh, particularly in places like the Western Ghats, our parks are very small in India. They're 300, 400, 500 square kilometers and they're important for the large mammals. But there are a lot of bird species, frog species that persist outside. Okay. So we're doing this massive study where we're sampling hundreds of plantations in the Western Ghats for birds and amphibian diversity and linking it to how each individual is managing their land, the decisions they're making from the kind of fertilizer they use to the trees they grow, and to see what um, combination of biodiversity is found on each person's land. And ultimately that will come up, help, uh, help us come up with effective solutions because not all species are just going to be in parks. There's a lot of wildlife outside and we need creative solutions where you encourage private landholders saying, hey, you have this really rare bird or really rare frog and maybe you want to think about managing your land in a slightly different way to ensure that, I mean, I found critically endangered frog species on my friend's coffee estate in Chikmangalore. We've rediscovered frog species that people haven't seen in 75 years. So, I mean, if you get away from tigers and elephants, there's yeah. a lot more to do.